What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to talk about COVID-19 vaccines. We're going to primarily talk about three vaccines that are being funded by Operation Warp Speed. We're going to talk about AstraZeneca or the Oxford vaccine, Moderna, and then Pfizer-BioNTech. What I want to preface, though, is that we're going to start this video talking about how these vaccines are being developed. What are the phases and stages they have to go through? Then we'll talk about the mechanism of action, how these vaccines actually work in the body. And then finally, we'll go over some of the interim or press release data that have been released by the companies about these vaccines. Also, before you guys go ahead and start this video, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also down in the description box, we'll have links to all our social media platforms for you guys to communicate with us. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how these vaccines, again, the ones that we're talking about that are funded by Operation Warp Seed, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, and AstraZeneca, what are the phases or uh, stages that they have to go through to receive um, FDA approval, in this case, emergency use authorization? So what we have to do is first have a complete understanding of what the goals of vaccine development is. So throughout all of these stages, there's two primary goals that we're trying to meet by developing these vaccines. The first goal that is going to be set forth is safety. That is the utmost priority for a vaccine being developed. In other words, we wanna make sure that any side effects that these patients or trials uh, that are being tested, any of the patients that are actually being tested with this vaccine aren't developing any serious or deadly side effects uh, related to the vaccine. The second reason we're doing a vaccine development, the other goal is efficacy. And this is what we have to expand on a little bit more because this is what's talked about a lot right now in the media. So efficacy can be thought of in two ways. It's basically uh, the efficacy of the vaccine to prevent disease, okay? Or the efficacy of the vaccine to prevent infection. That is two distinctions that we truly have to understand. So what are we talking about when we're talking about efficacy? What we're really saying is this uh, protective against disease. Or is it protective against infection. Why is that so important that we establish that distinction? Because COVID-19, the disease that's caused by SARS-CoV-2, can actually present with symptoms ranging from mild to moderate to severe where they're hospitalized, put on ventilators, ECMO, so on and so forth. Or they could be completely asymptomatic. So when someone is infected with this SARS-CoV-2 virus, they could be completely asymptomatic and not develop any of the mild, moderate, or uh, severe cases. So what we want to know is, is this vaccine effective against preventing the severity of the disease, or can it even prevent asymptomatic infections and then those people continuously spreading the disease? And that's something that these vaccines are still trying to work out. They're primarily focusing on disease, severity of cases. That's the primary endpoint. So when we start a vaccine, what are the phases that it has to go through and how are they basically taste, uh, testing and uh, trying to meet the goals of safety and efficacy? Well, there's a couple different phases. We're gonna kind of list them out so you have them and then we're gonna discuss what they do in those phases. The first one is your preclinical phase. And this is primarily where you do animal testing. Okay, this is animal testing. After that, if animal testing is basically safe and effective, you move on to the human trials. Human trials in your clinical phase, which is this three part, purple, pink, and then this brown color here, consist of three phases. Phase one, right, is gonna be where you're taking on human trials, but it's a small population size. Then after that, you're moving on to the next phase. If it's still effective and safe, then you're gonna be going on to phase two. And it's still, you're still doing human trials. It's just a little bit of a larger sample size. After that, if again, still safe and effective, you're moving on to the next phase, which is phase three, okay? And then again, this is just a larger human population sample size that you're testing. Finally, if it's met all the safety and effective goals that it had planned out for that vaccine, it then is sent for FDA approval. And in this case, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're looking for emergency use authorization here. And then they'll still have follow-up studies where they'll peer, be peer-reviewed journals and things that are being set up afterwards. So within the preclinical phase or animal testing, what are they really doing? I guess that's an important question to ask, right? 
And the first thing that we know is they're obviously testing this on animals. Why are they, what are they doing with the animals? Well, first off, they're giving the vaccine to the animals, right? And after you give the vaccine to animals, okay, in this case, mice, little mices, you're going to look for any side effects, okay? So you're monitoring their side effects. Do they have anything from just skin irritation to fatigue, to fever, or death? The other thing is you're looking at efficacy. So in other words, if I give this person the vaccine, do they develop antibodies? Is there a certain amount of antibodies they developed? And are those antibodies actually effective at combating, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Then what we'll do is we'll actually give the mice the virus, okay? And then after you give them the virus, you look to see, did the vaccine that you give them prevent the disease? If after all of these studies that you've gone through, where you give the vaccine to the animals, you look for side effects, efficacy by antibody production and antibody actually binding to the pathogen, and you've given the virus and you've seen some prevention of disease, you can move on to phase one. All right, with phase one, we're testing this on humans, right? So now this is, this you're giving the vaccine to humans. But here's an important thing to understand. When we're giving it to humans, we're only doing it on a small sample size. So this is a small sample size. What, how much? Generally, it's at least less than 100 participants that are involved in that study. Okay, so there's not a lot. The next thing is that the humans that you're studying and testing this on, you want them to be healthy. You don't want them to have really any comorbidities or underlying illness, because if they do get sick, you wanna make sure that it's from the illness and it's not from the vaccine that you're testing on them, okay? The next thing that you're testing is you're still testing side effects. Is there any side effects that you're seeing from this vaccine? From skin irritation, to fatigue, to fever, to headaches, anything. Worst case, death. And then the last thing that you're testing here is dosage, okay? And what do I mean by dosage? You're trying to figure out the upper limit of the dose, and you're trying to find the lower limit of the dose. There's a reason for this. If you give the upper limit of the dose too much of it, what are you more likely to experience potentially with a higher dosage of the vaccine? There could be more risk of side effects. So you're trying to figure out what dose can I go to that really the side effects aren't actually happening as much. But then on the other end, you wanna make sure that you don't give, you don't wanna give uh, not enough of that dosage because then you might have a decreased antibody response. And maybe if you're not getting enough of an antibody response, that vaccine won't be effective in that case, okay? So you wanna find that sweet spot somewhere in between these two. And that's what phase one is trying to figure out. If everything is still moving smoothly, you move on to phase two. And again, in phase two, you're still testing that vaccine, to, you're giving it to humans. But now, what did I tell you? The sample size is a little bit bigger, maybe a moderate sample size. And when I say moderate sample size, I'm saying in comparison to the small sample size. You could have anywhere from maybe 100 to like 1,000 participants okay, involved in this study, so it's a little bit larger. Here's the next thing. The humans in this study, we did it on healthy individuals, first in phase one. In this one, we want it to match the demographics of the population who we're gonna be giving this vaccine to. We wanna match this to age, right? So generally 18 and above, we wanna match it to race, to gender, to underlying comorbidities like lung disease, heart disease, so on and so forth. So you want to make sure that the people that you're giving this vaccine to, they're not really healthy, they could be healthy, but you wanna make sure that you put in there some African Americans, Hispanics, old age, young age, those with disease, those without disease. Okay, so you get a better representation of it. The next thing is you're still monitoring side effects in this case, right? So you're still looking for side effects. But the end goal is usually in phase one, you found that sweet dosage, that sweet spot. You're looking to see is the dosage that we gave, is the dosage basically effective? Okay, so you're trying to see is the dosage that we determine in phase one, is it effective? Okay? 
phase three is really what m these vaccines are at right now and they're getting emergency use authorization. They'll probably have it within the next couple weeks. Um, and this is phase three is you're testing the vaccine still on humans. So it's still on humans, but here's where it's a little different. Well, first off, m small, medium, you guys can already tell, this is a large sample size, okay? And when I say large sample size, I'm saying it's anywhere from, uh, it's in your thousands. So it could be anywhere from like a thousand to tens of thousands, right? Uh, with AstraZeneca, their goal is to get up to 60,000 participants, which is a huge sample size. So now again, the vaccine that you're testing, we're, we're testing it on humans, right? But again, it's important to remember that you want these humans to, that you're testing it on to match the demographics of the population that you are going to be giving this vaccine to. Okay, and what does that mean? That means you have to take into consideration uh, the age, anywhere from 18 generally and up. Again, you're testing it on people who are uh, healthy, who are not, have underlying disease, uh, white, African-American, Asian, all of those things, okay? The last thing here is you're trying to monitor the effectivity of this disease, uh, of this vaccine in a real life situation. So basically you're giving the vaccine to the humans, right? You're letting them go out, perform all their normal daily activities, and then basically you're gonna come and have them, they're gonna be receiving like monitoring, right? And you're gonna be monitoring, some of them will monitor symptoms, and then they'll do a, a PCR test to confirm the diagnosis, or some of them will, won't even worry about the symptoms and they'll just do regular swabbing of the patient and then look to see if it becomes positive. And basically what they're looking at is how many of the people who got the vaccine, who went out in the real world and were doing their normal daily activities, got the, got the disease, okay? And you're also gonna have another study group with all of these, which you have to have a control group, which is the placebo group. So they could be also going out into the, the world and getting uh, the disease, but again, with that group, you're usually giving them like saline or something else that's not really effective. So again, once we've gone through all of these stages and we found out the efficacy of this vaccine towards the end, then you move to emergency use authorization for FDA approval, and then you can start on basically this vaccine, okay? All right, so we've established how these vaccines kind of come to fruition, right? We talked about the phases that they have to go through. And right now, the Moderna, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and the AstraZeneca or Oxford vaccine are in that phase three right on the verge of uh, emergency use authorization. Okay, in some areas it actually has already been kind of authorized. Um, but for right now, what I want us to talk about is how these vaccines produce an immune response, right? How in the heck do we develop antibodies against this vaccine? I think that's important. I think it's a, there's a lot of kind of questions about that, especially for mine. I wanna know how they work. So with Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech, they kind of have the same type of technology that they're using for their vaccines. It's mRNA technology. So what they do is they take this orange thing here, right? This orange thing, we call this orange thing that's wrapping around the mRNA, we call it a lipid nanoparticle. So this like orange thing here is called a lipid nanoparticle. And all that is, it is just literally a phospholipid bilayer that's wrapping around the mRNA to basically act as a vehicle or transport mechanism for the virus into the host cell. So they take a lipid nanoparticle and then in the lipid nanoparticle, they have the mRNA. Now the mRNA was derived from like the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? You had to take into consideration that with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, okay, which is the thing that the, the virus that causes COVID-19, you have different proteins that are kind of coming off of that virus, right? And the one that has the most kind of things that we know that are involved with the pathogenicity is the S protein, okay? And so what they're doing is they're taking the S protein and working their way backwards to find the mRNA that is basically being translated or coded for that protein. Then taking that mRNA and incorporating it into this actual lipid nanoparticle. Then they're using the lipid nanoparticle with the mRNA and obviously you'll get an injection, right? Usually like the deltoid. This nanoparticle will then invade host cells, any kind of cell. And when this actual lipid nanoparticle fuses with the cell membrane of a host cell, what happens? Well, it kind of looks like this. It would fuse here and then it would release 
the mRNA into this cell. Now, once the mRNA is in this host cell, what happens? It does not get involved with our nucleus whatsoever, okay? It doesn't get it incorporated into the DNA. What happens is the mRNA actually uses our cell's ribosomes. And when it uses the cell's ribosomes or the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the result of that is that you're going to have taking mRNA and making proteins, right? You're going to be making proteins. And whenever you're making proteins from mRNA, what is that process called where you get mRNA to proteins? That's called translation. So the translation of the mRNA into proteins is occurring. Now, once that happens, these proteins are then going to go and get expressed on the cell membrane on two types of proteins that our cells will express. One of those proteins is called an MHC2 protein. And this is only found on what's called antigen presenting cells. And I'll write down in a second what those are. The other protein can also get expressed on another surface molecule expressed on the cell membrane of our host cells. And this is called MHC1 proteins. Now MHC1 proteins are found on all nucleated cells in the body. So any cell with a nucleus will have an MHC1 complex. But the MHC2 complex is only found on a couple cells. B cells, right, which are your lymphocytes. Your macrophages, which are uh, basically another one of your actual white blood cells. And then another one called dendritic cells, okay? So these are really the only cells that have these MHC2 complexes. Now, when they express these, basically these viral protein, the S protein shape, on the actual uh, complexes, what does it do? Well, it attracts in immune system cells. What kind of immune system cells? I'm so glad you asked. One is called a T helper cell. It attracts in a T helper cell. Now, you know T, T helper cells, remember, but TH cell, okay, TH cell. This has a particular type of membrane protein that interacts with that viral antigen, or in this case, the shape of the S protein. And that's called a TCR. But then it has another protein which interacts with the MHC2 complex. And that is called a CD4 protein. Once this interaction occurs between these two things, that T cell becomes activated. And it starts to release cytokines. And there's a ton of these cytokines that they release. What kind? interleukin-2, interleukin-4, interleukin-5, all these different things. The whole thing that happens with this is that all these interleukins, they do a couple things. They tell a particular cell in your body, very, very important cell, especially with regards to what we're talking about here, called a B cell, to proliferate. So it tells our B cells to go ahead and proliferate. But when they proliferate, we also want them to differentiate. And when they differentiate, they differentiate into these very, very special cells called plasma cells. And these plasma cells, once they're developed and stimulated due to these different cytokines being released, guess what they start to do? They start to make antibodies. And guess what these antibodies are directed against? They're directed against the S protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And if we can have that antibody bind on to that protein on the virus, we could neutralize the virus or enhance the destruction of the virus. That's beautiful, and this is one of the main ways. But it's also important to realize another thing, okay? Now, before I go on though, you also have to rem remember these cytokines, not only do they cause proliferation of B cells to make plasma cells and what's called memory B cells, um, but it also stimulates your T helper cells and tells your T helper cells to also proliferate and make a lot of memory T cells and a lot of effector T cells. So you're going to make a ton of immune system cells that are going to help in generating this immune response. That's important to remember. The other process here is a little bit more uh, morbid. <laughs> uh, you have another cell here called the cytotoxic T cell. So we're going to put T cytotoxic cell. It interacts with this MHC1 complex via its TCR, but it has another protein here called a CD8 protein. What is it called? CD8 protein. 
when it interacts with this complex here, it releases some very dangerous molecules that cause the destruction of this cell. Okay, but it also releases other cytokines that amplifies this immune response that we just talked about. Isn't that cool? So that's kind of how this Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is actually helping us to generate an immune response. The question is, is how, and this is what I asked too, and I don't think we know yet, how long do these antibodies last and are effective against this virus? It's, it's uncertain at this point in time. There's obviously theoretical numbers that are dropped around. Some say six to eight months. Some say that we're gonna need booster shots. Again, I don't think we know all of that just yet. But this is what we know about the Moderna Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Now let's talk about AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. All right, so next one is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. This one is not mRNA technology. This actually uses something really interesting. It doesn't use a lipid nanoparticle. So you see this brown structure here, this brown structure which is housing the uh, nucleic acid inside of it is called a chimpanzee adenovirus. And this chimpanzee adenovirus, chimpan chimpanzees haven't really been exposed to a lot of the human uh, kind of population, so we won't generate an immune response to the, to the adenovirus itself. We're going to try to generate an immune response to the protein that's going to be expressed by the DNA housed in, and that's why we're using the chimp adenovirus. But inside of the chimpanzee adenovirus is a DNA molecule. Okay, there's a DNA molecule. And the same kind of process is kind of working here where this DNA expresses a protein that is very similar to the S peptide of the virus. So the same kind of process is what we're kind of doing here is we're kind of taking into consideration that what's our goal, we want to generate an immune response to this S peptide, right? And so ways that we could be doing that is by kind of converting this right into an mRNA and then basically converting this into DNA and then incorporating that DNA into this chimpanzee adenovirus, right? And then whatever this DNA is expressing inside of this host cell, it'll lead to antibodies directed against the S peptide. So how does it do that? It's pretty much the same kind of process here. The chimpanzee adenovirus, when you inject it in, right, deltoid, it'll then, again, latch on to this host cell. When it latches onto the host cell, it'll release the DNA into the host cell, right into the cytoplasm. And then when it releases that host DNA into the cytoplasm, what happens is the DNA migrates into the nucleus, right? So you have your nucleus of the cell. Once in that nucleus, it does not get incorporated into the DNA from what uh, AstraZeneca says. They say that they use the host cells uh, enzymes to convert the DNA into mRNA. Then they take the mRNA that's generated here and put it out into the cytoplasm where it will then interact with our, the, the host cell's ribosomes. Then the ribosomes, whether free or bound to rough into plasmic reticulum, will then get translated and make proteins, right? And these proteins will then do what? They'll get expressed on this cell membrane. And you guys already know what happens here. What happens? It expresses this on MHC1 complexes and MHC2 complexes. And then the result is the same, right? We're not gonna go through the whole process because we already talked about it, but you have your T cells here, your helper T cells. They generate an immune response. And that does what? It tells B cells to turn into plasma cells. And then these plasma cells generate antibodies. And these antibodies are generated against the S peptide on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? And you're generating memory T cells as well. So a lot of that stuff is still happening. The other thing is you still have those cytotoxic T cells. And those cytotoxic T cells are still gonna be interacting with the MHC1 complexes. And again, when they're doing that, they're still gonna be releasing uh, destructive molecules that cause the damage of this host cell.
but also release cytokines that are going to aid in kind of your antibody response as well. And this response is really what we're looking at, okay? So again, this is how these vaccines are working. And now that we understand that, now we can go over some of the interim and press release data on these vaccines. All right, so we've already talked about how we developed the vaccine, the phases it has to go through to get approval and what they're going through right now. We talked about how the vaccine works, right? How it generates an, a, an antibody response or an immunogenic response. Uh, and how whenever we're exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we have those antibodies and we have those activated immune system cells to fight the virus off to prevent the disease. How did Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, and AstraZeneca go about getting these efficacy results? Well, Moderna gives their, their vaccine in two dosages. All of them give it in two dosages. You're gonna get it on day zero, for Moderna and then on day 28, okay? Then approximately 14 days later and on, if you develop any symptoms of COVID-19, you come in, you get tested, okay? They started off with about a sample size of around 30,000 participants. That's a pretty decent sample size. And then obviously with these 30,000 participants, you break it up into two groups, right? You have a placebo group, and in this case, that placebo group is just receiving like saline. They're not really getting the vaccine. And then the other group is the vaccine group. They're the ones that are getting the Moderna vaccine. Well, after they carried out this study and they had them come back, if they had symptoms and, and if they t tested positive, they would include that data. Then once they unblinded and found out how many people tested positive, uh, they looked to see which ones were placebo and which ones were vaccine. The ones who were in the placebo group, about 185 people tested positive for COVID-19. 185. Now, this is a very big difference when you talk about it with respect to the vaccine. The vaccine, only 11 people tested positive uh, for, the vac uh, for the actual uh, COVID-19. Now, here's what's even more marvelous. Those who tested positive for COVID-19 were a part of that vaccine group. Zero of them developed severe symptoms. Whereas in the placebo group, those who tested positive for COVID-19, there was around 30 severe cases. So when you look at that and you calculate efficacy, you can actually calculate efficacy in two ways. I could calculate the efficacy here of two endpoints. One is just against the disease itself, right? The kind of the mild, moderate aspects of it. And then the other one is against the severe disease. And if you do all the calculations here against the disease itself, where you take um, out of 185 placebo and 11 vaccine, you would take 185 minus 11, right? And you would get somewhere around 174 over 185, multiply that by 100, you're gonna get around 94.5% efficacy against the disease. That's amazing. When you talk about severe disease though, what are you doing? Well, you're taking in consideration here uh, that zero people develop severe disease. So out of 100%, out of 100%, you subtract zero percentage right, because none of them got the severe disease. And what do you get? You get 100% efficacy against the severe diseases, okay? So that's very impressive when we're talking about Moderna. The next thing that we have to talk about here is another aspect of it that's coming up a lot between especially Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech is their storage temperatures. They actually prefer that in order for their uh, vaccine to be viable, to be super viable and to be at the best capabilities it can be, we want that to be somewhere around negative four degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Now, uh, for those of you, that's also uh, negative 20 degrees Celsius. So that is a little bit cold, but it's nowhere near as the temperature that you require for Pfizer, which is unbelievable. Uh, that. And that might come into effect with infrastructure costs. And that really might be the only big difference in uh, uh, kind of determining which one would be utilized. All right, the next thing that's also very important to remember is the number of vaccines that are being developed, that they kind of uh, estimate how many vaccines they'll have uh, by the end of 2020. So by the end of 2020, we see potentially around uh, 20 million 
uh, samples of this actual vaccine. But what's even more impressive is that in 2021, by the end of 2021, we see somewhere around 1 billion um, vaccines okay, that could be potentially produced um, by uh, Moderna. And so that's an important thing to remember. The next thing is Pfizer-BioNTech. Pfizer-BioNTech is a, also, again, same type of technology, but when you look at how they went about doing their study, it's the same kind of setup. They took and gave a first dose at day zero, they went to 21. So day 21, you get the second dose. And then what happens is uh, seven days later, so seven days after you get your second vaccine, again, you say, okay, do, do, they're going to be checking in with the participants. Do you develop any symptoms? If they develop any symptoms, then you go and get tested for COVID-19. You get the PCR test. Now, participants, this one actually had more participants than the Moderna they had around approximately 40, uh, 43,000 participants. That's a, that's a decent amount. And again, same concept here. They broke it up into the placebo group who are gonna be getting the saline, and then they broke this up into the vaccine group who will be getting the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. When you take into consideration how many people who tested positive after they unblinded it and looked to see which one was placebo, which one was vaccine, they found that the placebo group was somewhere around uh, 162 cases. So 162 uh, cases of the COVID-19. For the vaccine group, eight. Eight tested positive. And that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So when you think about that, uh, that's a pretty big difference there in efficacy already. That's around 95%, and we'll calculate that out. But here's the other aspect. Again, go on to the severity of the disease. When you look at this, 162 of those cases, only nine of, the, uh, nine of them, which is still interesting. And that could be due to demographics of where the, it could be due to a bunch of different things, age, gender, it could have been due to the population area of where they were testing the vaccine. There's a lot of things that can go into this, but they only had nine cases um, of severe symptoms. Whereas with the vaccine group, they only had one case of severe symptoms. Okay, so again, that's still extremely impressive. All right, so now that we've determined kind of the results here, we have to determine, come up with a conclusion basically of how effective it is, right? So we're looking at efficacy. How effective is this vaccine against developing uh, just in general, like the disease itself, right? So uh, mild to moderate kind of symptoms. And we don't know yet, is this also asymptomatic cases? I think that's still questions that we have to figure out in the future. Um, but also, is it effective against severe disease? And when you come and calculate this out, you're taking, again, how many people in the placebo group, 162, how many people in the vaccine group, eight, 162 minus eight is around 154. Take 154 divided by 162, multiply it by 100, and you're gonna get somewhere around 95% effective, okay, against the disease. If you look at severity of the disease, again, you're taking 100% of the, the sample, basically, right? And what you're doing here is that one, out of eight develop severe symptoms. So if you take one divided by eight, which is approximately 12.5%, and you take 100% minus 12.5%, you're gonna get somewhere around 87.5% effective against severe disease, okay? So again, a very, very significant difference when we're talking about this. This is pretty amazing what both of these vaccines can do. Storage temperature is where there might be a downside, though. <clears throat> uh, Pfizer BioNTech says that they don't see it being too difficult. They say that they can build an infrastructure. I just I don't know how much the cost is going to come out to be uh, for all of that process. But their vaccine viability is a little bit more stringent. Um, so they need the temperatures to, for the vaccine to kind of be transported and live a long time, of being, to being a, not live, but to be a very viable and effective we need that temperature to be somewhere around negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's about negative 70 degrees Celsius. So that, that's, that's, that's really, really cold. You're gonna need very specific infrastructures to help to support that. And the transport is gonna be also very difficult. So that might come into play with overall cost. Number of vaccine though, when you look at how much they expect to have, in 2020, they see potentially 50 million. So 50 million units of those vaccines. Whereas in the end of 2021, they see somewhere around 1.3 billion uh, units of the vaccine being produced. 
So that's, again, very similar in efficacy, very similar in a lot of their data. Just really the only kind of big difference here is the temperature uh, that might come into play here. All right, so the last vaccine that I want us to talk about is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Pretty cool vaccine, same kind of dosing regimen as we talked about with Moderna and Pfizer. Within their study, they gave a dose at, on day zero, then they gave a dose on day 28. And then what happened is 14 days later after they gave the second dose, what's interesting is that they didn't really look for the this classical symptoms of COVID, they just tested them, they did swabs. So they looked for those who tested positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus according to that RT-PCR which there's some interesting things with that. And I think that needs to be a little bit uh, further analyzed. And the reason why is the Pfizer and Moderna, their endpoints was, was primarily looking at disease, right? And disease can mean that you, you're showing symptoms of an infection. Whereas with AstraZeneca, with this, it seems like they also had another kind of endpoint there where they're looking at infection, where someone can be infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and not be symptomatic. They can be asymptomatic, which is one of the things about this virus is that a lot of the times people don't show any symptoms but still have the infection and can transmit it easily. So I think that needs to be studied a little bit more, and that's pretty interesting. Regardless, though, when they did this study, um, there was a little hiccup. But the hiccup actually was a pretty interesting thing, and I think it brought about some good stuff. And here's what happened. They did um, a study in Brazil, and then they also did a study in UK, right? So we had a study that happened in Brazil, and then you had a study that happened in UK. The Brazil study, we had a total of about uh, 9,000 participants, right? So they had about 9,000 participants in the study for that one. In the UK, they had about 3,000 participants in the study. And the same thing, you have to give a control group and you have to have a vaccine group. So you had a group that had the placebo and then you had the group that got the vaccine, in this case, the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the same thing in UK, they got the placebo and then again, they also got the vaccine. Here's where it's a teensy bit different in comparison to what we talked about with the Pfizer and the Moderna. The placebo within Brazil and UK, the first placebo that they get on day zero is actually the meningococcal uh, vaccine. So they wanted to kind of replicate something very similar to what it would be like to get a vaccine rather than saline. So they got the meningococcal on the first dose and then saline on the second dose. In the USA, they're not doing that. They're just doing saline. But I thought that was pretty interesting. Now, what happened that is very interesting here is that their Brazil study, when they gave the dosage on day zero and on day 28, it was a one dosage on day zero and then a one dosage, full dose, on day 28. Now, that might seem obvious. But in UK, by some accident, they gave a half a dose on day zero and then a full dose on day 28. When they did this, something very interesting resulted out of this. After they went through, figured out the total number of uh, infected cases, which was around 131, they unblinded it, figured out how many were placebo, how many were vaccine. And whenever they did that and they came up with the calculations that we talked about similarly, they got an efficacy in Brazil of about 62% within the vaccine group. Within the UK, they had an efficacy of a whopping 90%. What the heck? They got a half a dose. That's interesting. So they had to pause the study a little bit. They're still, they're going to be doing it in the USA and in other countries as well. But what they had to do is come up with a combined analysis. So they took the Brazil and the UK study. And again, if you look at that, how many participants would you have around about, about 12,000 around that. And what they did is they look and they determined how many of these cases was there that actually, again, how many infections were there. And if you look at it, there was 131 cases that were positive, right? So 30, 131 of those participants tested positive. When they unblinded it and figured out again, after they kind of did all this information, calculated everything, they came up with an efficacy, a combined analysis of efficacy of around 70% when you take these two things here. So efficacy of approximately 70%. Here's what's also very interesting. Now, some people might be like, oh, efficacy of 70% compared to 95%. Well, one thing, there is a 90% efficacy with this half dose. That has to be studied a little bit more. But here's the other interesting thing. Even though there is a 70% efficacy with this combined analysis, which I think they did them dirty a little bit with this, but nonetheless, 
if you look at this 131 cases here that are positive, guess how many of these actually had severe symptoms of COVID-19? Zero. And that's a beautiful thing when you think about it because that reduces the cases of severe hospitalization on ventilators, ECMO, uh, and death, basically. So that's a very beautiful thing to see that as well. So they're still carrying this study out um, in the U.S., other countries. The goal is to get a total number of participants of about 60,000. That's a lot. I don't know if I, if I can remember another study that has that many uh, participants in it. So that's pretty amazing. All right. The next thing that we have to talk about here is we talked about the results here. We got to talk about the storage temp. This is a beautiful benefit of AstraZeneca. When you look at the storage temp that they need to keep their vaccine uh, viable, it's actually very interesting. They don't require super cooling like refrigeration systems like, uh, like Pfizer does. And so one of the things that you look at is if you look at the temperature, it's around 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Now in Celsius, that's about 2.2 degrees Celsius to about 7.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's beautiful because that could be a benefit when it comes to this. They can actually keep this in normal refrigerators in that sense. All right, the last thing here that we have to talk about, and this is another beautiful thing and a benefit of AstraZeneca is they estimate that by the end of 2021 or somewhere within 2021, they can generate around 3 billion uh, units of these vaccines. But guess what? If they figure out how and why that this actual dosage is properly affected, that you can get the highest efficacy with this, guess how much we could actually up this dosage? I mean, the uh, units. We could potentially go all the way up to 4.5 billion units. So that's relatively attractive as well. And this is one of the cheaper ones as well uh, when it comes to study process. Last thing that I want you guys to remember is with these vaccines, a lot of the common questions that come up is side effects. Is this going to you know, kill me? Is this going to give me Guillain-Barre syndrome? Is this going to give uh, cause me to end up going into anaphylaxis? From what the company data and interim analysis, all the press release data shows, from what we see, they're very mild, uh, minimal side effects. For example, they're seeing small percentages of pain at the injection site, which you get with the flu shot, maybe a little bit of redness, fatigue, headaches, um, and maybe some muscle and joint pain. Um, again, I think there needs to be more studies done to truly evaluate this risk. There's a risk with any vaccine uh, when you take it. But again, from what the data is showing from these companies, there is very minimal side effects. And that's a beautiful thing when it comes to these vaccines. All right. So engineers, within this video, we talk about all these COVID-19 vaccines. We cover how they are developed. We cover their mechanism of action. And we cover some of the company and Terran press release data on these vaccines. I hope it helped. And I hope that you guys did enjoy it. As always, engineers, until next time.